It is a big week for big tech, especially with artificial intelligence in focus. Both Microsoft and Alphabet facing investor concerns around higher costs amid the ongoing AI arms race. And my next guest is at the forefront of what's happening in that space. Joining me now is Joe Lonsdale, 8VC founding partner and Palantir co-founder. Joe, it is good to have you on the show and to see you. And maybe I'll, I'll just start there, Joe. You know, listen, we've heard from some big tech names this week. I got Microsoft and Alphabet. We got Amazon, Apple, Meta on deck, and we know a focus for investors, Joe, it has been on AI. I guess just to start, Joe, I'm curious, how do you see that technology kind of evolving from here, Joe? And do you believe we're going to really start seeing now this real ramp in use cases and, and monetization? It's great to see you, Josh. <clears throat> you know, AI is a big story in the venture capital world. It's what we're focused on. These things take a little while to build. Most of the money right now is in infrastructure. It's in the obvious applications of AI. The, the big applications, though, for the for the decade, for the 2020s, is going to be in productivity. And you're going to start seeing productivity hit a lot of areas in the next few years. A lot of these are smaller now. We're still building them, but we're building them quickly. You're going to start seeing, I mean, you talk to guys like Michael Dell at Dell. You know, he's expecting a lot of higher productivity the next couple of years at Dell in certain areas. But it's going to spread to, I think, pr probably most of the Fortune 500. I think this is very bullish overall over kind of a five-year period. You're going to start seeing the numbers, I think, in the economy hit 26, 27, most likely, would be my guess. And Joe, I'd imagine there's a lot of AI founders, startups knocking on your door. How do you as a venture investor, Joe, how do you kind of separate, let's call it hype from reality? Well, you know, it's like everything else. The two things that matter the most in venture capital, it's it's top talent and what's possible now that wasn't possible before. And that and, and what's possible to create real economic values is what we're looking at, right? So, you know, if, if you're just sprinkling a little bit of AI pixie dust on something and suddenly it works, that's actually probably not very valuable as a real company. The things that you actually have to do, Josh, to make most of these things work is a lot of really hard data work. A lot like the stuff we did back at Palantir in the day and the Palantir still does today is like going into these places, organizing the ontologies, putting the workflows together, and then using what's possible in AI, plus these workflows. And this is applying to things, you know, I'll give you an example, healthcare billing, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars a year spent on that in the US. We're gonna probably make this three or four times more productive. It's gonna save the, the country a lot of money, it's gonna make a lot of money. And there's, there, there's probably a dozen areas like that that are that big where we can fix them. And Joe, let's talk about another area where you have a lot of expertise in, and that's that's the defense tech uh, area, Joe. You know, you, you co-founded Palantir, co-founded Epirus. You were, you know, early investor in Palmer Lucky's Anduril. How is AI kind of upending, redefining defense? I mean, AI is actually. You know, it's absolutely critical for defense here. You you need people and computers to work together. You need to have the people do what they're the best at and computers do what they're the best at. And when it comes to targeting and tracking and a lot of different tactics, uh, people aren't fast enough anymore if you're competing with AI. People are still part of the equation. They're part of the strategy. They're deciding what we're going to do in war. But you know, if you have swarms of little ships and in, in the you make, you make a thousand small ships that are weaponized for the cost of one big ship and how those ships work together, how they go on missions, that's, you know, if you're targeting drones that are coming in, we saw the drones unfortunately attack us in Jordan the other day. AI systems should be identifying if they're friend or foe. We didn't have those there. And AI systems should be shooting them down with technology like EPRIS, EMP. You can take microwave radiation, turn these drones off from far away, protect American lives, protect allies' lives. This is all stuff where AI plays a key part and we need to make the DOD go faster in implementing it. Why, why isn't that, Joe? Why aren't these technologies getting to American war fighters faster? Well, you know, it, it's, it's actually really frustrating as a patriot, Josh. Back in the 1990s, 2000s, when I was at Stanford, we'd hear of stories of how the government was so far ahead in the 60s and 70s. There's stuff that the NSA and others did in the 70s that we didn't figure out until 20 years later why they were doing it, you know, in the top of academia and other places. Nowadays, a lot of the best talent's gone to Silicon Valley during the first bubble 20 years ago. Uh, if you're a really great technologist, you go into companies, you're paid really well, you own a big piece of it. If you go into the DOD as a great technologist right now, most of them reject that culture because you're not treated respectfully there. It takes 20, 30 years to get to the top. So the DOD does not understand software, does not understand these cultures, doesn't even know if it has the best people or not. And that's a, that's a huge cultural problem there. And you know, there's a lot of great generals and admirals that are kind of aware of this. They're trying to work with the best new companies. They're trying to fix it. There's a big, slow bureaucracy and it's controlled by the old giant defense companies. And so they're generally pretty slow right now. Is that where a company like, like in your opinion, Joe, like Anduril comes in? This is, this. you know, Anduril's done a great job, not only of attracting 
some of the very top talents, some of our best buys from Palantir are there. Obviously, Palmer Lucky, you know, and others have recruited amazing people. But they've done a great job of building a game on the hill. When you're building a defense company, you need to build the best new technologies to, to you know, terrify our, our enemies. But you also need to build a really good game on the hill in D.C. where you're t teaching Congress, teaching the DOD what you're doing and why it's so much better. And they've done a great job of both of those. It's a good lesson to others to, to follow. Andrew Andrew's doing amazing work. And Joe, you talked about, you know, potential advantages of, ha you know, deploying AI on the battlefield. What are some risks, though, Joe? How concerned are you about bad actors? actors employing this technology. You know, any new technology is going to have bad actors using it along with good actors and listen, our enemies, I mean, I mean China, Iran, Russia, there there are people there who are using AI to build things as well. They're going to have great systems, they're going to be really advanced. Ours need to be better than theirs. And so so and you know, is is it scary that I mean, is there some like kind of future where AI takes over and goes and attacks people? I mean, I think that's kind of ridiculous. Like maybe that's something that, you know, in the far, far future with AI, you know, to, to worry about. But right now, the question is, can our systems outperform their systems? Can our systems save lives and protect lives? Or, or can, they def can they defeat the bad guys? And right now we have the best software in the world in the U.S. And we need to use it to make sure we stay ahead of them and we protect American lives and defeat them. And Joe, I want, I want to switch gears here a bit, talking about another subject uh, near and dear to your heart, which is American politics. You know, Joe, you were a, a supporter of Governor DeSantis, um, a believer. I think you donated to his campaign. Obviously, he's out. It certainly looks like, Joe, at this point, Trump could secure that nomination. If he does, Joe, do you throw your support behind Trump in 2024? You know, Josh, I've spent most of my time working in states. The reason I had back to Santos earlier is I, I, you know, Cicero Institute, which I work on, is a nonpartisan institute. We're in 19 states. He was one of the most competent governors we'd work with, getting great things done. And you know, I was disappointed he, you know, didn't work out from the national stage. And uh, you know, in general, I'm I'm not that involved in in the presidential election. I will say I'm very frustrated to see uh, this current administration going after friends of mine like Elon Musk illegitimately and, and attacking them in so many different ways with activists right now. It's, it's extraordinarily frustrating. So, you know, I, I can imagine getting involved just because I'm pissed off that they're unfairly attacking good people. All right, Joe, I want to get you out on this. You have a, a new university as well I want to talk about. The University in Texas Board of Trustees includes people like Barry Weiss, uh, Niall Ferguson. Why did you start that university, Joe? What's the problem you're, you're trying to solve for? Well, Neil and Barry are, are just have been amazing co-founders here with Pano and others. You know, Josh, we're trying to have one of the universities that's one of the top universities in our country not be run by illiberal forces. I think you we started this two years ago. People didn't know what I was talking about. You've seen now since October 7th some of the things coming out of our universities. I think a lot of people have woken up and said, wow. These places have been conquered by ideologues who are extremely radical, who don't represent America, who don't allow free speech, don't allow debates, don't you know, don't stand up to anti-Semitism at the same time that they're they're going after anyone who violates any of their woke shibboleths. It's uh, these places are broken. You know what we need, Josh, is we need a place where young people come. They learn to have open debates. They're able to argue both sides, and they're able to learn how to be courageous citizens to fight for the future of America. And and, and right now we don't have that. Other schools. I want a place that people who are proud of America, who want to be part of the solution can come and can learn how to do that. And Joe, though, you know, if, if the issue is on those campuses, Joe, did you ever think about maybe, you know, if that's the problem, that you would put more time and energy and effort into kind of changing the culture at Amer established American colleges and universities rather than starting your own? You know, a lot of us have spent a lot of money trying to do things like this. And it's kind of like saying, did you go to IBM and fix it? Or do you start Palantir? And what's happened to these universities, Josh, people don't realize uh, you have, you know, departments have not have not brought in people to disagree with them for a very long time. Their professors are in charge there. There's more administrators at these schools. Yale and Harvard have more administrators than students, and the administrators are far more radical ideologically than even the professors. You have hordes of lawyers. I mean, it's, it's not just that the pr presidents that we just fired at Harvard were corrupt. It's that there's multiple corrupt layers underneath them that have been conquered over the last 30 years. These places are, are going to take generation to fix at least. And we need at least one place to prove that it's possible to have a great university again that's not conquered by crazy people. Joe, I appreciate you having on the show. And it's always clear where you stand. And we appreciate that. Thanks for the time. Thank you.